Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead and call this meeting the November 24th meeting of the Salisbury City Council to order. Good evening and welcome to what we have is a pretty large crowd. Um, I'll go ahead and say in advance we do have some um, requests for comment on um, one of our on our ordinance tonight. Um, we also have, uh, I'm sure, some additional commenters. If you do have a comment to make, please make sure that you uh, get one of these little nifty forms over here on this table, fill that out. Um, and I'll also just ask that everyone remember that we do have a, a time limit on our uh, remarks of three minutes. Um, as long as that list doesn't grow too long, we'll, we'll keep it at that this evening. Um, and we will be watching the clock just so that we're not here all night long. Uh, city Council and staff are aware that we had a meeting that went till 1030 <laughs> a few nights ago or uh, a week ago. Um, so with that, uh, we have uh, some wonderful community organizations with us this evening. But first and foremost, uh, we have Reverend James Riley uh, with us this evening, uh, pastor at Nelson Memorial United Methodist Church. Uh, Reverend, if you wouldn't mind joining us and leading us in the city invocation. I, uh, I like that response. People stand when I come to the podium. <laughs> they don't do it for me. Is this on TV or something? Uh, can I, can I uh, tell my folks to watch this and take notes? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, sir. You may be seated, please. <laughs> uh, first, let me say thank you for inviting uh, me. Uh, I received the invitation and thought, well, this is kind of weird. I'm not. Salisbury resident. Uh, you know, I live in Hebron, not Salisbury. And uh, on a little deeper reflection, uh, I must say that I truly appreciate being a part of this because <coughs> Hebron being just a couple miles out of Salisbury, like all the other little towns surrounding Salisbury, we work here in Salisbury. We sleep in Hebron, but we eat in Salisbury and we play in Salisbury and pretty much do everything except sleep. And uh, Thank you for including us in this process and for uh, valuing the role of faith and divine guidance in the process. So let us pray. Almighty and all-knowing God of us all, thank you for the men and women of this council who give their time and their energy to discuss and decide the important issues facing Salisbury. I thank you for their willingness to receive your wisdom and your guidance in the process. And I pray specifically that tonight you would pour out your wisdom upon them, that you would give them the gift of discernment and of knowledge as they ponder and as they decide the things that will affect all of us in and around Salisbury. So guide the process, the discussion, the remarks, and the decisions we ask in your holy and mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend. If everyone will please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all so much. Uh, next, um, I'll invite the mayor to the podium, and um, do you want to invite up uh, uh, Zoo Director Ralph Bylin? Good, good evening, Council. Um, we have a special presentation tonight that I will call up uh, our Zoo Director, uh, Ralph Pylon, who will introduce to us our representatives from um, the American Zoological Association for the award. Uh, um, that they are here to bestow. I will, because Ralph will not do this, just ask all of you to keep in your prayers. Uh, the 22-year-old panther that died, was it panther? Jaguar. It's Jaguar, Jaguar panther. <laughs> it was dark. It's a cat. Um, it was, it was mellow. 
melanistic. I read that today. That's a word that I did not know that allows uh, the jaguar to be of, of the dark color. So if you will, 22 years, uh, the animal graced the Salisbury Zoo. So if we can remember the zoo and, uh, and that animal in your prayers this evening, that would be great. So Ralph, if you'll come forward, introduce our guest, and begin to make the presentation. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Council President, uh, members of the Salisbury City Council, guests, colleagues. Um, thank you for taking time to share with us. Frequently at, at the start of these meetings, the mayor's office and the, and the city council take time to recognize uh, the contributions and accomplishments of various civic and community organizations. But tonight we wanted to shift that focus just a little bit. It's important for us to recognize that any accomplishment made at the Salisbury Zoo is made possible by the guidance and support of the Office of, of Mayor Ireton, of the Salisbury City Council, the contribution of the various departments uh, within the city of Salisbury, and in particular, our Department of Public Works, um, and, and yet ultimately also by the, all the citizens of the city of Salisbury. And so tonight we're very pleased to have with us Mr. Jim Maddy, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And he will present, not to the zoo, but to the city of Salisbury, a plaque recognizing the continued professional accreditation of the Salisbury Zoo. Jim. Thank you. So uh, this is a great achievement, uh, accreditation of a zoological institution, a collection of living uh, objects, is, uh, is a very serious business. Uh, we're in the life and death uh, business uh, at the zoo, uh, if you will. And there is only one accreditation standard for zoological institutions in North America, and that is accreditation by, uh, by my organization, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. There are 228 zoos and aquariums in the United States, Mexico, and the Caribbean that meet. This standard, there are 10 times that number of institutions that are displaying animals for the enjoyment of the public, licensed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but who do not meet these accreditation standards. So there's one accreditation standard, you meet it. It's the same one that's met by the San Diego Zoo, the, the world famous Bronx Zoo, the St. Louis Zoo, the Smithsonian National Zoo. When it comes to animal care, when it comes to veterinary care, nutrition, housing, education programs, conservation programs, and modern zoological practice. You can be small, you can go big, but, there's, but there is this one common standard of animal care, and that's the standard uh, that you've met. Why does that make a difference? It makes you a better employer, it makes you a better partner, and you cannot be involved in wildlife conservation without really extensive, meaningful, deep partnerships with fellow the zoos and fellow aquariums and wildlife agencies at the federal, state, and local level and other uh, players in that field. So accreditation says we're a science-driven organization, we're professional, we're serious about what we're doing. We know how and do provide the highest standards of animal care and welfare, but we go beyond that and we demonstrate to our visitors how to be involved in wildlife conservation and we offer, and this is one I really Want to, want to hammer home here this evening for just a second. You offer, I, I know because you're an accredited uh, zoo, you have the plans, the budgets, the staffing, and the facilities to offer a meaningful educational experience to every child that comes through there, every teacher, every parent, everyone uh, who comes through there. You're seeing about uh, a little over 300,000 uh, visitors this year, I believe. That's an awful lot of people to offer a meaningful educational experience to. And I don't kid myself for a minute that every one of your visitors is looking for a meaningful educational experience. Most of them are looking for, a, for an enjoyable experience, an, an enriching experience for their family, for their church group, their school group, whatever the case might be. But I, do, I don't want to leave town without reminding everyone in this room and certainly everyone on the council and the mayor and the city administration that that commitment to conservation and that commitment to public education is really what sets you apart from several hundred other organizations that probably do a pretty good job in their animal care, might not quite meet all of our standards, but maybe do a pretty good job. But it's that commitment to the community, to public education, and to engaging the community massively in wildlife conservation at a time, unfortunately, 
around the world when habitat is not improving, when conditions for wildlife uh, are actually not on a positive and favorable trend in a world in which there are lots of species and taxa that are facing extinction, but for the work of these accredited uh, zoos and aquariums. I'm really here to congratulate you for that. The final thing I want to say is the animal health facility you've built, that animal hospital at your zoo right here in Salisbury is a jewel. That's as nice a facility as I've seen anywhere in the country and I've seen a lot of them just this year and you can imagine how many I've seen in years prior to that. So the commitment that the city made, that, the, that, the, that your office made, that you followed through on, the work that the, that the city public works agency performed and making sure that that got done right and on budget and, and on time, truly, truly outstanding performance. And my expectation would be that'll energize the community, that'll boost your confidence, you'll raise your, your sights, and over the next 10 years you'll build a, a, an even better you know, zoological and cultural attraction you know, right here. My guess is you're already one of the biggest draws uh, in the county uh, in terms of tourism and economic impact. One of the things our association does is we help you measure that, we help you model that and forecast economic impact. So if that's ever something that you want Ralph and his staff uh, to give you additional help on, they can work with us and we can generate uh, good solid uh, numbers on that score. But with 300,000 visitors in a community of this size, a budget of that size, uh, you know you're having that positive economic impact. And it's not unusual for a zoo to be a real driver in the, in the regional tourism economy and in the local, uh, local employment uh, specter uh, as well. So my congratulations to, uh, to all of you. And, uh, read it for you. Let me read this if I could. And you know, we, uh, we can see if we get the folks. microphone a little closer yeah. to step right up in there. We can oh, see a few right. folks in the audience that have their, uh, their zoo uh, uh, shirts and jackets on. And uh, so those are the folks who actually literally got their hands dirty earning uh, this accreditation a plaque, so uh, so our congratulations goes to them as well, of course. In, in they fact, could stand up. While yeah, you in do fact, this, maybe. what I'd love what I'd love to do is, as you read that, can we have the public works and zoo employees who are here with us tonight come join you, Mr. Please. Mayor, up there? Yeah. We're going to actually what we'll do is we'll have you read it, and then we're going to get a big picture. Perfect. Council and everybody, so go ahead and do this. So I'm here to announce officially that the Association of Zoos and Aquariums honors the Salisbury Zoological Park having satisfied the qualitative evaluation and professional standards of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Accreditation Commission. You're hereby granted accreditation, and this is good through now, through September 30, 2019. It's signed by Dr. Jackie Ogden, who's the Chief of Zoological uh, Affairs at, uh, at the Great Walt Disney Company, and by Jim Anderson, who chairs the Accreditation Commission and runs uh, the Children's Zoo in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So uh, you earned it. Uh, this proves it. And uh, congratulations very much. As we set up for the picture, if you will walk around, let's just also remember um, all of our partners at the zoo, including the Zoo Commission, including the Friends of the Salisbury Zoo including the Delmarva Zoological yeah. Society, all those people, and those incredible people who work for us and our public works department leaders uh, that, that get us through this um, every day. Come on, Ron.
Mr. Council President, if while yes, we are Mayor. settling, um, I'd like to take a moment to um, recognize uh, Delegate Elect Chris Adams, who has joined us today, who represents parts of Salisbury. We want to welcome him and we look forward to the partnership of working with him. And also, and she will not like this, but I would also like to uh, recognize uh, the Council President's wife. Um, uh, <laughs> who has joined us this evening, who has uh, come off an incredible week uh, for teachers uh, during American Education Week and does an incredible job teaching at Pittsville Elementary and Middle School. And we just want to take the opportunity to welcome her to Chambers this evening, Mr. Council President. Not that I'm sure you know she's here. I, I think both my wife and Delegate Adams are thoroughly embarrassed. They're both blushing. <laughs> They're both blushing. Welcome to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you to uh, the zoo staff, um, uh, zoo commission members, and Mr. Ratty. I don't know if he makes it to uh, all 228 of those right. zoos as they get accredited, but he came to ours, and that's pretty great. Um, OK, the next item on our agenda is the adoption of the legislative agenda. I will entertain a motion to adopt the legislative agenda as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Ms. Shields? I like to move. Um, Ordinance number 2306, after the consent agenda, please. Okay. I have pre another engagement, and um, I apologize to uh, Ms. Miller, but I have another engagement that I have to do. <laughs> oh, she's... <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'll put that after the consent agenda. Looks like she'll forgive you. Thank you. Is there a second? Sure, let's jump right on it. <laughs> I'll second that, okay. Mr. Spees, thank you. Jump thank you very much. Fire. Thank you very much. <laughs> All those in favor of the amendment, please signify your support by saying aye. 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 And chair votes aye. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, uh, legislative agenda as amended, please say, oh. I have a question before we do that. We yes, were, Ms. Mitchell. We were again handed a document with changes that were made very late in the day, not submitted in time for the packet. Um, it's not redlined. I don't know what the changes are. And it's several pages. I'd like to ask Chief Pappas how um, time sensitive this is, because I really don't like being put in Which position, uh, the fire department. Fire. The, the, and where did it come from? Uh, from the attorney's office oh, okay. at 410 this afternoon. Um, Ms. And we were just given, it that, given this at the table. And I really am not comfortable voting on things that I haven't had a chance to read and review. I'm tired of it. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Ho Chief Office, uh, anything you'd like to add for our edification? Uh, we were also uh, given these changes this afternoon, so I understand uh, that. We, um, we would appreciate the opportunity for the, uh, the, the city attorney to go through them, but if that's not the will of the council, we can wait and do it next time. Chief. It is, unfortunately, it is time sensitive. Um, and we would, we would love to have it heard tonight because it keeps the project on, on, on task and on schedule. Um, what, what was presented to you uh, tonight represents changes that a third party, the ind other individuals that not of the city's control that Mr. Tillman had to take time to review. And we did that just as expeditiously as possible. Uh, Mr. Tillman can answer about the timeliness of the, of the submission Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But it, it is time sensitive. But ultimately, council gets to uh, make that decision. Mr. Spees, did you have something? Ordinarily, I would say yes and agree with um, Ms. Mitchell. But I would really like to hear what the substance of the changes is before I make a determination as to what my vote will be. Uh, oh, and, and I would agree with that. We have an opportunity to, to hear what those changes are at the time we discuss it, and we can table it if we need to. Um, That's fine. Ms. Mitchell, I, I agree with you uh, regarding you know, getting things at the table late in the game. Um, you know, are you Especially okay? Especially not a red line of uh, version where we can readily see what's I, I agree. I agree. Um, are you okay with us hearing it tonight? And Mr. Tillman has agreed to provide a detailed 
explanation of what changes came in at the last minute. We'll make that. That's fine. We'll make the determination when we read it. Understood. Thank you for accommodating. Thank you, Council. Okay. All right. With that, thank you, Chief. Uh, with that, I'll entertain. Excuse me. With that, all those in favor of the legislative agenda as amended, please signify your support by saying aye. 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 And chair votes aye. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right. Ms. Nichols, already a step ahead. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. On the consent agenda tonight, we have November 3rd, 2014 work session minutes, the November 3rd, 2014 closed session minutes, the November 10th <coughs> regular meeting minutes, resolution 2462 authorizing Delmarva collections to collect delinquent accounts, and resolution number 2463 accepting Osprey Property Company LLC's contribution to the streetscape improvements to Fitzwater Street Corridor. And that concludes the consent agenda. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda as presented, please signify your support by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. And just want to acknowledge and thank Osprey Property Company for contributing to a public project, private company contributing to a public project for streetscape improvements in that corridor. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of great beautification in that area very near in the very near future. All right. N next on the agenda is uh, ordinance number 2306 for second reading. Uh, this is the stormwater utility fee ordinance. Um, entertain a motion to approve ordinance 2306. So moved. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Tillman. Right, the last reading, I did my speed reading version of the uh, introductory <laughs> language of, of this ordinance. But uh, in, sh in short, the, uh, this is the ordinance to establish uh, the fees and the, and the uh, right of the city of Salisbury to assess those fees based on the uh, uh, stormwater, you know, controlling the quality and the uh, amount of stormwater that's generated. If you have any sp specific requirements about the details, um, Obviously, they need to be answered by the Department of Public Works. Um, if you have any questions about the ordinance, I'll be happy to try and answer them with the assistance of Public Works. Um, and if you would like, I will read. <laughs> no, I, I don't think you need to read it at this point. We've been working on this for over a year. Um, at this point, uh, though, I would like to um, bring members of the public who have requested to speak forward. Uh, first, I have is Ms. Gibson. <clears throat> Kay Gibson, resident of Salisbury. I hope you're all planning on voting no. We don't need another tax or fee in the city of Salisbury. We are already paying for this service through our property tax. We don't need you all putting our, your hands in our pocket. I think the November 4th election was a message to all tax and spend politicians. As my grandpa would say, you all got your ass kicked. We can do it again, and we will do it again. Bottom line is you need to look at the neighborhoods in Salisbury. You need to go through them. You need to know how many houses are not selling. How many houses are vacant? How many houses are becoming derelict? It's happening because you all constantly are increasing taxes. People don't want to be taxed twice for the same service. They don't want to move in here and pay $100 or $200 a month more for taxes and a house payment than if they live in the county. You're hurting us. You're hurting our property values with these kind of behaviors. We can't sell our homes. We can't get out from under. And I'm really very disappointed in many members of the council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Uh, next, I have Mr. Drew. Hi, good evening. Uh, Matt Drew, uh, 301 North Claremont uh, Drive, Salisbury, Maryland. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, 
three minutes. I'll keep it to three minutes. Um, first off, uh, I appreciate the, the work that this body has done as well as um, the folks at Public Works to take a serious look at this. Um, the last time we, we did a major look at this, um, in my mind, there were some, some pretty serious gaps in terms of the way that this proposed ordinance was going to be fairly um, implemented. And I think this revised ordinance goes a long way toward uh, improving the overall fairness. Um, particularly, um, one of the, the concerns that I had is that um, there wasn't any distinction made between properties that had existing stormwater management systems on the property themselves versus properties that didn't do anything to, to properly manage stormwater. There's certainly some improvements in the language that, that go to address that inequity. Um, one thing I would say is I, I would love to see um, some examples be developed to show, uh, particularly commercial property owners, how this ordinance might affect them. Um, in particular, I, I picked two as, as a possible example. Um, and I'm, I'm a customer of both, so I'm, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna, um, they're both businesses I like doing business with, but um, I'd love to see a comparison of, of Giant Foods versus uh, the CVS at the corner of, uh, of South Salisbury Boulevard and, and College Avenue. The reason I picked those two as an example is that one has an existing legacy system that dates probably back to the, the 1950s, if I had to estimate, in terms of its management of stormwater. So it does a great job of preventing the, the property from flooding, but it doesn't do anything uh, to, to mitigate um, um, nutrient quality coming off the property. Compare that, so that would be the Giant Foods property. Compare that to the CVS, a very recent uh, development meets the, the requirements, uh, the latest 2009 version of the MDE requirements, where um, stormwater quantity, so flooding, and quality, so nutrition and pollutants, both of those are controlled on that property. And I'd lo just love to see a comparison of what, what is the impact of one property versus another in terms of the, the utility fees that they could expect to, uh, to pay under this po um, policy. A um, couple details I I'd love to see improved. Um, there's no credit given for disconnection of roof leaders, sheet flow to conservation areas, or rain barrels in this proposed policy. I think those are good practices, and I think uh, property owners should be able to um, get credit for those. Um, one thing I'd really love to see some clarification on is how will this fee be determined? Um, in, in my mind, um, if, if there's a projection of what the capital needs of the city are going to be to improve stormwater um, versus the number of users or um, and the way that they would pay into those, um, you would simply divide one into the other and that becomes the fee. Um, I, I'd love to see some explanation in terms of that. So that, that's my version of how I think it should work, but, but there's no clarif there should be a clarification of what the method is for determining what the fee is going to be. Um, I'd love to see um, at least some discussion in terms of, of what the expectations are of the city staff um, within the Public Works Department to, to um, enact this ordinance. I, I, as I think through um, the applications that are going to happen for waivers or credits uh, to this. Um, and and, and I, as an engineer in the community, I get to work with these great folks every day, and I know they do a good job, and that they, they, they are always being asked to do more and more and more, and this is going to be yet another more that they're being asked to do. So, so I, I'd, I'd love to hear what, uh, from a staffing standpoint, the plan is. And then the last thing um, is, is just a basic legal question that I have that I'd love to see clarified is that if, if a fee is charged for this, and this is called a utility, um, is there also an implication that a service is going to be provided um, for that utility? And, and what my real concern is that if, if the city charger charges a fee for a stormwater utility and a particular property has a problem with stormwater management and, and heaven forbid that they become flooded and there's property damage, does that then implicate the city as being responsible because they, they charged a fee for a service, and yet the service wasn't provided. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Jura. Next, uh, I have Dr. Stribling. Good evening. I'm Judith Stribling. I live at 3984 Texas Road in Bivalve. I'm not a city resident, but... As, Dr. As Reverend Riley said, um, we all spend our lives in Salisbury, and, and I have been a part of the uh, Ripper Project for a number of years. I also 
advise the Wicomico Creek Watchers and uh, supervise the science part of that program. I don't speak for Creek Watchers because they're not an advocacy group by any means, but I would just like to remind you that <clears throat> our recent um, report for the Wicomico Creek Watchers for 2013 illustrated the dramatic effect of stormwater on the Wicomico River uh, water quality. So in three years of very low rainfall, we had seen a modest improvement over the course of time, and in 2013, that improvement was quite um, dramatically reversed. Um, it wasn't as bad as it you know, might have been. Um, we see some uh, of our efforts paying off, but we definitely see the link between stormwater and water quality right in our own river. Wicomico River used to be the number one bass fishing river on the bay. I think it was a major destination at any rate, uh, a very important recreational um, water body, and water quality has declined to the point where um, that is, not, is no longer the case. Um, I salute the city and Mayor Ireton for the efforts to make it fishable and swimmable, and I think this goes a long way towards doing that. Um, I understand there are issues that need to be addressed with, with implementation, and I don't have the expertise to advise you on that, but I, I uh, commend you for taking this on as uh, a service to the, city, the citizens of the city of Salisbury. This will increase their property values, it will increase their quality of life, and it will increase the quality of water in the Wicomico River. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Mr. Hensler. Hi, my name is Mick Hensler, uh, 408 Camden Avenue, Salisbury, uh, off and on lifelong resident. Um, it's interesting, I, I, I just spent an hour right before coming here uh, checking my boat down at uh, um, uh, the Cedar Hill Marina and uh, had a chance to talk with the good doctor's husband for about an hour. Um, interesting, just happenstance. Um, I would like to, uh, if I could just put a rubber stamp on what Mr. Drew said, um, uh, he hit about all of my all of my technical talking points that I was going to say tonight. So I won't I won't reiterate that. But what I do want to say is, as a as a lifelong resident, um, I do remember when the Wicomico was a clean or somewhat clean river, uh, and I've seen it go downhill ever since then. Uh, in a recent um, poll done by Outside Magazine of the top 100 destination cities and towns in the United States. They all had one thing in common, and I think it's a very, very crucial thing that Salisbury is looking at. Um, I would like to see more. And that is the one thing that these destination uh, 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 places had where people want to live. They all had water. And most of the top 10 and top 20 communities had done drastic things to improve the quality of their waterways, including access, uh, 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 swimmability, fishability, uh, just making it a more uh, cleaner, safer environment. Um, and I think that's something that Salisbury uh, is, is, is really starting to take a hard look at. And this is, uh, this particular, um, what are we calling it, an ordinance? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think goes a long way to send a message uh, to surrounding communities uh, that Salisbury takes this as the largest municipality on the Eastern Shore, takes uh, their contribution to uh, the pollution of our rivers and our bays very seriously, and I think it is something well worth. And if the fees are what you say they are going to be, take my money. That's all I got to say. I, I am in 100% support of this. So, and I'm also a small business owner, so I understand the implications to businesses as well. Um, the businesses that I've talked to uh, don't understand this, so that's about the only thing that I would, I would say and, and kind of piggyback on what Mr. Drew said, is, 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 to, is to reach out to the business community and, and really, really get their input on, on this and, and work with them as to what they can expect from fees from this. Because, you know, a place like Giant, that could be, that could be a deal breaker for them to... to you know, come to this town. So, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Hensel. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Mr. Fisher. Eric Fisher with Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, one time, 
proud um, office resident <laughs> of Salisbury. We're in Easton now to be um, in service to the shore as a whole, but um, it's great to be back tonight. Um, my family is another um, frequent uh, participant in the Salisbury community, and it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I wanted to say two things. First, to applaud the city council, the mayor, and the city um, as a whole for getting to this point. Um, President Day mentioned that it's been over a year that the ordinance has been on the table. I, I would say that it's been five years that this dis discussion has been going forward, um, going all the way back to an environmental task force of community citizens and residents um, in 2009 that first made the recommendation to, to move forward with something like this. Um, this is really an initiative that is coming from the community and it's recommending a proposal, a program that will stay in the community and allow the community to control its own destiny when it comes to stormwater and controlling polluted runoff. So, um, you know, these, these folks, when they sat down in this committee, they saw the flooding in the community, they saw the trash, the toxic chemicals, all that stuff that gets brought up in flooding situations. They saw the erosion, my goodness, we're having to save parking lots from the river <laughs> because of polluted runoff at this point. Um, and they know that we can't swim in the ponds anymore, which is something that we used to do. Um, that's why we're here, that's why we're talking about this. And so I would encourage the city council to go ahead and take this next step. It is a very responsible step to take. I think it's a very timely step. Um, I wanted to note that um, far from government largesse, uh, this is action. Uh, this is a project list. We know what's going to be funded by this money. We know which neighborhoods. We know which problem areas in terms of polluted runoff we can address. We know how to address them. That project list is prioritized by cost effectiveness. So the biggest bang for the buck is right there at the top. This is a very responsible approach that the council's taken. We applaud you for that. Um, we also believe that the approach you're taking, the two-step process um, to get the ordinance in place and then um, deal with the fees, uh, allows for the very kinds of discussion that I think some folks would like to have. Um, so with your adoption of this ordinance, I think it will put the council in a very good position to have those conversations with some basic expectations um, in place. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your action. And we ask for your vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, Mr. Mayor, yep. wanted to offer you and your staff an opportunity to speak to the <laughs> proposed ordinance. We did um, receive Mr. Drew's questions uh, on Friday and worked over the weekend uh, to have answers. I think you all have the questions. He did email them to you and staff did work over the weekend with answers to them. And if it is the will of the council, um, both Mr. Moulds and Ms. Uh, Pollock are here to, uh, to discuss the answers to those questions that they worked on over the weekend, if that's Great. your pleasure. Absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> as the mayor mentioned, I appreciate Matt getting us the questions so we could look them over. Um, one of the first ones was the idea of how to allow for the credits on the systems. Um, one of the initial things when we redid the ordinance was we put together the worksheets, uh, drafted those in terms of how, I don't know if you had gotten those, Matt, they were from an early workshop that had been done. Um, one of the important things in terms of this whole discussion was when we first did the initial ordinance, it was based on the city, town of Berlin. And with the desire to pull into the whole idea of the credit program, uh, it helps you if you don't have to reinvent the wheel, per se. So what we utilized was the city of Rockville as far as the basis for developing their credit program. Um, Rockville has had a stormwater utility in place since 2009. It's a similar city to Salisbury, population of 60,000. Uh, it's under the same regulatory constraints as uh, the city with a uh, MS4 permit for stormwater as well as the uh, Chesapeake Bay drainage area. So it was a good uh, way of looking into that and how to develop those type of uh, programs in terms of dealing with the credits and stuff like that. So um, there's a good website they've got on that. And Matt, if you are interested, we do have, them. they were draft worksheets that helped to figure out how those credits are calculated. 
Um, obviously, in terms of the different examples that are there, um, one of the charges we had when we went back to relook at the ordinance was we got support from the council to start working with Salisbury University in calculating the impervious areas uh, that would go into the calculation of what the fee is. Uh, we've been working with them. I'd say they're within 90, 95% complete of that. We're going through our quality control on that. But that information will be uh, available to start working through those calculations and seeing how that data, uh, GIS data, geographic information system, and aerial data uh, to, to do the calculations on that. Um, there was, you did have a comment too about the uh, wanting to include what we call non-structural type credits into the system. Uh, the city of Rockville, going back to them, did not include those type of facilities. Uh, they are not eligible for credit because they don't typically have a structural maintenance burden. One of the interesting aspects of having the credit program is there has to be a renewal because one of the important parts of having stormwater facilities is that they are properly maintained. It's not a thing where you put it in the ground and boop, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It requires to get recertified for that credit to show that those facilities are being maintained. So it was an important part of the credit system and those type of structural facilities. I would mention that the type of non-structural type facilities, for example, rain gardens, we have, will have a grant program that will be a one-time type grant that could be provided for homeowners to put those type of things in and offset those kind of costs. Mr. Moltz, can I interrupt just sure. to ask a question about that? Um, could our grant program be used to purchase something that is non-structural like a rain barrel? Yes, that's what I mean. In term, instead of credit... Not just the rain gardens you mentioned. But well, rain gardens, rain barrels, the, the rain barrels is what I was referring to okay. in terms of being able to do that for homeowners. And, because and, remember, we, we will have a minimum fee of one ERU. I get right. Yeah. So, the, and the other question I had is, couldn't, I mean, it would make sense to me if um, there was a similar credit given if the impact was similar for something that was non-structural. And if instead of maintenance, couldn't we use that it was still there, it presence rather than maintenance as the standard to be measured year on year if we're <coughs> trying to determine is that utility, is that piece of the utility on their property still being maintained? Well, it, uh, one of the requirements in anybody that puts a stormwater facility in is they have to have a stormwater management agreement that has their responsibility for cleaning it or keeping it maintained. Typically, these type of non-structural things, keeping it mowed, uh, keeping grass, uh, turning into weeds and things like that. Um, and that's going to be a requirement of the property owner. And we have to also demonstrate to the state that we are inspecting those facilities on every two, three years. They were to follow through on that. Okay. So they're, they're in the provisions in the, those worksheets that I talked about, and again, this is the wording that was used in Rockville, that a stormwater facility receives only aesthetic maintenance from the owners, not eligible for a credit. Understood. Okay. Um, just, let's see where we were at. The ERU fee, again, I think we're, we're using the worksheets will help with that. And as we have the data available with the... Um, impervious area calculations. That'll give a better idea how those calculations are done. The credit applies to a, a discount of the uh, impervious area. So in other words, if you've got X number and you get a percent credit that comes off that area, then you calculate the result times whatever the fee is per square foot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Spies, you sure. had a question? Will this opportunity be available over time? Uh, you, you, you said there was a specific uh, time frame for the grant. Um, I, I see this as, you know, should this be enacted as a, an opportunity for learning how to, to mitigate stormwater on a specific <coughs> property. So is there a reward for people doing that Absolutely. down the road? One of the biggest challenges we will have as a city in terms of meeting our water quality goals is to get the private property owners involved in cleaning up stormwater. And through the grant program, through the opportunities for credits, as through retrofitting those type of facilities, um, someone could do that and be eligible for those types of uh, offsets. And these will be available long term? Absolutely. It will be continuous. Thank you. Yep. That's most of my question. Thank okay. 
Staffing, if you remember some of our earlier discussions when the Maryland Finance Institute had done their calculations, they were concerned because they were, uh, they were staffing estimates that were creating a whole new department. And one of the recommendations that came from Public Works is because of the background that Amanda and I both have in stormwater, um, we felt we uh, would be better off trying to manage the stormwater utility within our department because, as you know, we already handle two, enter two enterprise funds, the water and the wastewater uh, funds, as well as the marina for that matter, and uh, focus a lot of the funding on shovel in the ground stuff. Um, it will utilize where we would have a consultant do designs of a particular project and construct that um, rather than just having a lot of staff. Uh, so it was a goal to try to do that to m maximize what kind of output we can do. Um, let's see, I think, let's see if I've got any other thing here. Just making some notes while you're up there, Matt. Um, I'm going to turn over the legal to Mark if you wanted to answer that one. Legal implications, mm -hmm. tax versus fee, and then service, uh, a service provision, and there being an expectation. Yeah, there, I don't, no contractual relationship would be uh, set by charging a fee in order to improve the stormwater management system. Um, to the extent that the city negligently designed its stormwater system, you know, to flood someone else's property, our liability would be no different under this law than it currently is. Um, and any negligence, uh, you know, would obviously be covered by the city's insurance carriers. So it, it uh, you know, the whole thing is designed to improve the system, not make it worse. So, you know, I, I can't imagine that it would make any significant difference whatsoever. Is this the, the issue of the 100-year flood, 200-year flood, or say the 300-year flood uh, that we had during the past hurricane? I'm wondering if that's, if yeah. that's where this question well, comes from. I think it comes from a reasonable assumption that there are going to be there's, there are going to be floods yeah. to come. Um, and what liability does the city bear after having introduced a fee to address stormwater and flooding? And I, I would say that you know, to Mr. Drew and anyone else wondering that this essentially is a, a not a legal contract, but a contract that we're going to work on. I mean, before now, the political winds can blow the funding one way or the other. And where it hasn't blown it is into the stormwater system. If you've had infrastructure there since 1910 that nobody's been maintaining at the level that we should have been. Um, and that's because it hasn't had a dedicated fund. Yeah, I, I think if we, if we took the fees, if we implemented this and collected the fees and did nothing that was on the list, then I think that argument might be valid. Um, but where it falls on the list and, and the argument that we did this priority based on our list and another property further down the list got flooded instead well you know we're trying to get to it I think that there, um, it's going to take time it took us time to get here it's going to take time to, to get it all corrected um, I think the only way I could see is if we did nothing with with the money yep um, Mr. Moulds did you have anything else the only other thing was or Mr. Tillman the, uh, the comment in terms of how we come up with the fee and, and weigh that with the number of projects. The way we see it is, is the way the council <coughs> currently does their projects in terms of their CIP. Um, typically with these type of public works projects, they go over several years in terms of the efforts to get the design, the permitting um, uh, through the state in order to do those kind of things. So what we would see is you know, looking at what kind of income you get through the utility, how that matches up with projects that are ranked by the Department of Public Works and how you want to proceed doing them and when we nip away at them. I think the only part that might not be satisfactory to people about that is that, you know, there will be a fee collected and it will be some time, perhaps years before you see, you know, or two years before you see project implemented that begins to address flooding issues. So if there's flooding in the interim, you know, I could see some frustration, you know. Yeah, again, what, uh, what was mentioned is you look at it from a cost-effective uh, approach. You want to go get the best bang for your buck. Those projects may be more far-reaching in terms of uh, meeting the needs of a lot of people versus more centralized type projects. Um, those are things you have to weigh in terms of doing it. The other thing, too, to keep in mind is what we talked about with this fee is this fee is used as leverage for getting grant money. 
So this is money that we want to hopefully double down uh, because any projects you go into now, because <clears throat> not only the city of Salisbury, but a lot of our municipalities in, in Maryland are going to be competing for this grant money. And it looks a lot better anytime you submit a grant money if there's a local share that can be contributed rather than just going up with your hand out for 100%. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And we did address the issue of employees or building a department of more people. Did, did we do that? He okay. did. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, council comment? May I? Yes, Ms. Shields. I'm listening to all this, and I've received <coughs> a call. I've received emails in support of this fee. I know we have EPA and MDA requirements with, that was different maybe 50 years ago. Um, this has weighed real hard for me. It's been real, real hard for me because I look at other citizens in our community that are on fixed incomes and they may not understand what you're trying to do. They see a flush tax already on their property bill or a, a something on the water bill. What is that on the water bill? The flush tax. Flush tax on the water flush bill. Tax. Flush tax on their tax bill too, isn't it? Stormwater. 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 Stormwater bill. Something about the bill, but storm water. So when you go and try to convince people why you need this fee, it's a hard sell. Um, Five dollars a quarter can buy a meal for someone. They, people on Social Security, they're, if they get a raise, whatever the raise is, their Medicare goes up. Or if they live in subsidized housing, their rent goes up. However, I look at, um, in saying this, I look at the pipes that came up out of uh, Parsons Road, because I never really seen like pipes like that. They were rusted aging and um, I can't forget and cannot forget Germania Circle which is in the community I live in that's flooded for I'm 65 for I know over 60 years it's been flooded one lady homeowner has since passed away and we have kept promising them uh, that we fix it and it has not been fixed and um, I look at uh, Dollar Avenue just last year, the flooding in Cody Cox and all the trash and debris that came out of that situation and um, Public Works did a Band-Aid fix um, and we're supposed to be working on that, correct? Okay, good. Um, also, I remember uh, some home, a homeowner that um, lived on the corner of Camden and Cow Street, we had a flooding issue. Um, I think to the point where they couldn't sell their house or they wanted to move or something. I can't remember that far back, but I know it was a concern about the flooding. And these are just a few of the situations around um, our community. And I know when I came on council in 2005, one of the uh, previous public works directors did a 20 year a, a study, got a, a $20,000 grant to do flooding, a flood study in the whole community of Salisbury. And I was surprised to see some of the communities that were, or neighborhoods that were in a flood zone, a flood plain. So this is a serious issue. And as I said before, we need to educate the folks on, um, why we need this, we may need to have PowerPoints to show the pipes that have come out under, underneath the system. We, meet, we may need to show um, the trash after a storm that has, that's laying in the drains and, and that would be part of my PowerPoint presentation. If, and you go to the senior, uh, the senior centers have uh, uh, community centers, the, uh, and they would be more interested, I think, than some of our younger folks, but some of the seniors would be appreciate that. They, all of them have community rooms that you could do a presentation so they could better understand the fee because they're gonna be charged the 
fee, even though they may rent or own their condominiums or whatever. I think we need to educate our people um, on this fee. Because just me saying, well, we need it because we need strong work. They don't, they don't <coughs> like pictures do a, say a million words. We need to actually show them the trash that goes in the river, show them the pipes that's coming out of our river, show them the water mains that have collapsed. We need to do that. And this idea just came to my head. <laughs> show them, show me that, you know, I'm from Missouri, show me. So that's what you need to do for the community, to explain to them why we need this. I will support this um, ordinance t this evening. Uh, like, but like I said, it was just, uh, I told a gentleman I talked to today, it just was, you know, I try to see both sides of the coin, but the, the good outweighs <coughs> that. And I think proper education will, will, will um, over, they overcome. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Mitchell, Mr. Spees. Mayor. Yes. I've looked at this for years. Um, over the past 40 years, the population of Salisbury has doubled. The motor traffic that comes through Salisbury is 500% of what it was 40 years ago. We are responsible for every bit of the pollutants that hits our ground. This isn't a water tax. This isn't a water fee. This is about what is washed into our waterways and filters down into our drinking water. The water that we drink every day, that we bathe in, that we wash our children in, that we make soda pop with, that we brew beer with. This is an economic, an economic imperative for us. And I think for us to get on board with it and be one of the few, few times that Salisbury is the first out of the starting gate says something about who we are, what we care about, and where we want to go. I, my vote will be a, a, a resounding yes, um, but I want to make sure that everyone knows that, that whatever money comes to this fund is totally, inexorably, dedicated to stormwater and stormwater runoff. Doesn't go to any other fund, doesn't fill in any blanks that any other fund can't fund, and doesn't go into the general fund. This is a dedicated fund specifically for our stormwater runoff. And to, to mitigate not the water itself, folks, but what is contained in the water, which is all the pollutants that we generate and the people that come through town generate but they are our guests and we are responsible for our guests. So please join with me and, and, and nod yes to, to, this, to this whole thing. We've, we've worked hard with this and I, I think that we're gonna stand out in the state of Maryland and, and as Mr. Mr. Mould says, this is, uh, this is an indication to the state that we are, we are concerned and adamant about what we're going to do with our stormwater and our pollutants. And please give us a hand, we deserve it. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spees. Ms. Mitchell. I'll be really quick, because I, I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, this is about doing what's right and meeting our responsibility as government and as a society to preserve our infrastructure and our natural resources. I don't want to leave my grounds and mounds of debt, as is often cited when we talk about fees or taxes. I want to leave them a viable community that takes care of its citizens and their interests by making sure that our stormwater systems can handle a good rainfall without flooding his home or his business. I want to leave him a community that can once again take their children to the park and fish and actually be able to eat what they catch that day. I want to leave him a community uh, where he can safely teach his children to swim in our local lakes and ponds like I did as a child. I learned to swim in Shoemaker Pond. He's learned to swim in a chlorinated pool at the YMCA. And that's not free either. It costs between $45 and $100 for every five lessons, so pretty much per month. Uh, we're talking about $20 a fee, $20 a quarter fee for helping to clean that up. Uh, comparatively, I think that's a pretty good bargain. $20 a year. A, a year, I'm sorry. $20 a year, I'm sorry. Even a quarter would be, it's still a bargain. $5 a quarter compared to the 45 per month for, for swimming. About $1.67 a week. Okay, thank you. Less than a cup of coffee to monetize that go. again. Uh, see, I wrote it down, I still messed it up. <laughs> uh, for me, the requirement to make these changes 
impact Salisbury. We, uh, we're required to reduce the pollutants in our runoff, our TMDLs, by the federal EPA. We can't escape that, nor should we try to, in my opinion. But the consequences of failing to address and improve our runoff will be far more costly than the proposed $20 per year per residence. Um, and I just have to say, if not who, if, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? We've heard that many times before. But if we don't repair and care for our infrastructure now, we are, in fact, leaving our children mounds of debt via crumbling pipes and vanishing farming and waterman industri industries that will be much harder and much more costly to regain than to maintain. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. I would like to <clears throat> Mr. ask Ms. Mitchell um, um, that this is not a $20 per resident. This is a $20 per property. Per, 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 per residential but the re property. The residential property. Thank you, yes. Cost is that. Right. The commercial fee will be different. Because I don't want a whole family thinking they're going to pay. No. <laughs> no. Wow. You're correct. You're okay. correct. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we did start our outreach to the community uh, last week at the Mayor's uh, Neighborhood Roundtable. Um, Amanda was there. Uh, our partners at CBF uh, were there with us. We have a whole nother eight or nine months before a final we'll be doing this outreach um, to educate people we have uh, in the past of course uh, Dame, done uh, rain barrels uh, with farmers and planters um, and uh, CBF and we are continuing to do that working with the trash you all also uh, approve um, every uh, every budget time another uh, another uh, I forget how much but these uh, the catch basins that go inside uh, our storm our inlets uh, to make sure that we're catching the trash as it goes so this is um, the environmental uh, task force policy was something uh, that was given to me when I became mayor and uh, we have done an incredible amount of those things on that list and to thank Mayor Tillman for her leadership uh, former council vice president Kamajis for his leadership in, uh, in getting us these recommendations and going ahead and ranking them for us and then to thank the staff uh, this is a this is a tough one, and we understand that this is a tough one. Um, but as uh, has always been our mantra here, is that um, regardless of elections, the federal government is going to is going to require us to do these things. Uh, when people talk about the flush tax, all I can tell you is that um, <laughs> 44 million of uh, the original 84 million at the wastewater treatment plant was that flush tax that came back to us far more than we ever put into it, and it will be 30. Two million of the new 64 million dollar uh, wastewater treatment plant far more than we would ever put into it um, as as citizens and um, property owners in our city so I understand that this is that this is tough and that the, the <coughs> political winds maybe uh, went the other way uh, the other night uh, but the federal government is going to require us to do something with this uh, let me also thank uh, dr. Stribling and all her work with uh, the river project throughout the years we're going to commence uh, talking about the quality of our water coming up with a large discussion about the paleo channel that will start at the beginning of 2015 and uh, again to staff who have taken all of your questions meeting after meeting council after council at this point this is this is two councils worth and and got them to a, a point where we know what this money is going to do it is not going to grow the size of government at all it is going to be with the expertise that we have uh, to begin addressing uh, Main Street uh, Mill Street uh, Germania Circle Delaware Street. Avenue, all of those things. So, Market Street. Uh, Market Street. Yes, we're doing that now with the help of DNR saving that parking lot uh, as well. So, again, a thank you to you all for this vote this evening and a thank you to staff and for the residents for uh, being here uh, to support this. Um, well, I have a couple of things to say. Um, you know, it occurs to me that doing what's right isn't always popular. Um, but judging by the emails and phone calls we've received over the last few days, this is both right and popular. Um, I have received more messages on this than anything else we've discussed or voted on since my election. <laughs> and all but three messages were in support. I want to take everyone back for a moment to 2013 when the fee, fee structure and the ordinance was proposed. We had an ordinance that um, was just an authorization um, and a fee structure proposed by our consultants that included mostly funding new staff. And, you know, through the leadership of the Department of Public Works, and the mayor and council, we've, I think, put a few more meat, uh, a little more meat on the bones 
um, and got something that we can really be proud of. Unfortunately, we can't claim to lead too much. Oxford beat us, Centerville beat us, Berlin beat us, um, towns across the state have beat us, cities that have had this infrastructure for a long time like us. Um, they've also shown more fiscal responsibility than we have up to this point, but we're getting there. We're catching up. Uh, we're the first big ones on the Eastern Shore to do it. Um, I'm more than willing to continue to show, you know, the community that we are interested in reducing fees and, and permits um, and permit fees uh, as well as timelines, permit timelines. Uh, I want us to continue to work on that, but this is prudent fiscal responsibility. Um, I also want to address uh, the uh, potential uh, Elimination of the, the uh, stormwater law uh, that was passed in the state um, that mandated a funding system for the 10 largest counties, uh, that has nothing to do with us. That has nothing to do with us. That has nothing to do with our community. That has nothing to do with the infrastructure that's been in our ground for 105 years. Um, it's got nothing to do with anything. Um, and uh, we have, for our 105 years, had infrastructure in the ground that we haven't paid to take care of. And we haven't taken care of it. Uh, we have uh, physical and infrastructural imperative. We have infrastructure that's falling apart um, because we have failed to take care of it for 105 years. Our current fiscal status, uh, I think, shows uh, that that imperative has arrived, that we need a stable, dedicated, and adequate fund uh, versus what is currently an unpredictable, rateable, and subject to politics um, fund um, and subject to political uh, priorities. And there's nothing wrong with having different priorities. But taking care of your infrastructure should be number one, um, or right up there. Um, I'll, I looked around at other places, and you know, Maryland is in, in no way unique except for that we have this new mandate for those 10 counties. That's unique. That's different. Uh, but in every one of the 50 states, there are municipal stormwater utilities. There are 700 of them nationwide. Most of them were put in place in the 70s. Ours is not new. Uh, there are 54% of those that created standalone agencies. Um, ours is in the minority. 33% are within the departments of public works, so uh, we're in the minority there. 20% um, of them sit on the tax bill, 10% on standalone bills, 70% with other bills like water and sewer. Nearly every single coastal state has a majority of their municipalities with them. Maryland is an exception there. Um, and the primary reason behind them was flood control and NPDES permits. Um, the average annual cost is $42 a household. Uh, we're proposing 20. I realized that what was recommended to us was 40. Um, that's something that we're going to have to grapple with and deal with. And um, you know, there may be a call from the public to step up, step it up in the future. Um, but you know, I think we all feel that starting uh, with a very modest fee is the uh, the best approach. 80% um, of those programs use impervious surface to calculate, uh, and that's what we're using, impervious surface, to calculate the fee. Again, most of those were created in the 70s. 0.009% of those fees were overturned by courts. That's one. One, ever, was overturned by the courts of municipal stormwater fees. A single one. If we look at our competition, and I look at Frederick, Maryland as our competition. If we look at our competition, a place that has successfully revitalized their downtown. They, they stalled when they failed to address flooding in the 70s. They got a lot of federal and state dollars in the last 10 years, and they've revitalized. And all of that on the basis of addressing flooding. And it makes the case that I think we need to really seriously address flooding on our west side and downtown with the, as one of the early or some of the early capital projects for this fee. I can't any longer look across the table, and I know none of us want to, and none of us can, at downtown business owners or residents of the west side and say, oh, there's nothing we can do. You bought a house in the low ground. Um, you know, you decided to invest in our city in the low ground. Uh, well, we're not going to do that anymore. And um, today I heard from uh, business owners on Main Street, Baptist Street, Calvert Street, and Poplar Hill Street in the downtown area uh, requesting uh, that we do something about it. And I, and I know the administration has sat down with many of those business owners. The business community has spoken. Um, I realized that also the chamber president stood right there and said, you must do this. It's an imperative. Um, and we heard today that the chamber requests that this be tabled. I don't understand that at all. Um, but uh, I assume that's pressure from 
you know, some individuals. Um, but it's, it's impossible. The people on the high ground have, uh, who have stood opposed, you know, they don't face the same challenges, the same issues that those on the low ground face. Uh, I think this is a responsible approach, even if it's 105 years late. And, and just a quick thought on fees. Um, there's a recent development on South Division Street uh, that uh, came to me and showed me all of their, the fees that they were um, being charged that they had to pay through the development process. And they weren't complaining. They were saying, just so you know, these are how many checks we have to write. This is what it's like, city, county, state, et cetera. Um, just, just the city fees, it was $500,000. Now, this is a substantial little development, but not, not a major project, but $500,000 in fees. Um, this, is, this would be, by uh, the calculations that I think, if I understand this correctly, $140 a year. I think there's so much more that we can do to reduce fees and to make the process easier for businesses who want to develop and want to grow Salisbury and grow Wicomico County's economy. And this is not the place to take a stand against fees. This is not it. This is not it. Because at the end of the day, when we don't have fees that explicitly pay for a, a utility, a, a use, uh, an action, a false alarm violation, something like that, then it ends up costing us more property taxes. That's the only other way. That's the alternative. So this opens the door to a conversation long term about a reduction in property taxes because we're adequately funding, adequately funding with a specific utility fee, the utility that we've had in the ground for 105 years. For those reasons and many, 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 many more that lead to a revitalized Salisbury, I support this ordinance. Um, I want to thank you, Mike and Amanda, for all the work that you and your staff put into this. I want to thank the citizens who have voiced their thoughts on this one way or the other. I want to thank Mr. Drew for his uh, questions that helped us shape the ordinance and the changes earlier on in this process. Um, you know, really appreciate that. And um, I want to thank the mayor and uh, city administrator for all the work that you two have put into this. Um, I encourage you us to make infrastructure improvements as early as possible in Germania Circle area, Market Street area downtown. Because I'm telling you, that's that's where the the water where you know at. the water meets the road. <laughs> that's I mean there, there's things that we can do immediately and and this is the way to do it. Um, yeah, and I encourage all of us to get on public education right away. Um, I, I know we've got a plan for that, but that's really important. So unless there's nothing else I'll yes. call the question. All those in favor of Ordinance 2306, please signify your support by saying aye. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the award of bids. I'll entertain a motion to approve the award of bids. So moved. <coughs> Second. Second. Ms. Miller. Good evening, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we have one award of bid and two declaration of surplus this evening. The first award of bid is for RFP 02-15, the Engineering Construction Services for Parkside High School Regional Lift Station and Mill Street Pump Station Improvements. The City of Salisbury Internal Services Department Procurement Division received a request from the Public Works Department to solicit bids for RFP 02-15. The project <coughs> includes both construction, administration, and inspection services for both locations. <coughs> the Procurement Department followed standard bid practices by advertising in the Daily Times on the City of Salisbury's website, utilizing the City's vendor list, and advertising on the State of Maryland's website, eMaryland Marketplace. A total of six vendors submitted a bid by the due date and time of Tuesday, September 30th, 2014 at 2.30 p.m. A six-person evaluation committee of Salisbury Public Works employees reviewed the vendor proposals and ranked each proposer on a scale of zero to four according to the evaluation criteria established in the RFP. George Miles and Burr, LLC, was determined by the evaluation committee to have presented the best proposal due to their clear understanding of the work required and staff experience. There are sufficient funds in the noted account to cover this purchase. The Procurement Department requests Council's approval to award RFP 02-15 to George Miles and Burr in the amount of $171,500. It's not been my experience that there's, and that's only 18 months of experience, 
that, that there's been this much variation in uh, what we're seeing here for the inspections, inspection fees, and even the construction administration fees when we look at one of the uh, bidders. Um, could you shed some light? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. When I looked at the fees, construction administration in particular jumped out. You can see that there were three firms where they were almost identical. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we revamped our RFP process for construction administration and inspection. In the past, the city had taken on the lead role for that, and our consultants were doing minor tasks. With the amount of projects we're bidding right now, including knowing that the treatment plant will be bid in the next few months, We've asked our consultants to take the lead role in construction administration, and, and we're there for support. So it is a larger scope. So the one price that looked small, you know, low out of range, I feel like was almost bidding on an older scope, which they all got the same RFP, but that's, that's in line with what we used to see. Okay. The other prices were, like I said, there's three right in the same range. That was a good number. And then we got a couple that were very much on the high end for... Uh, these projects, which these two pump stations are relatively straightforward. These are not quite as challenging as the ones that you saw recently, Northside and Southside pump station. Of course, they're all very critical, but these are a little bit easier. And the inspection rates, uh, we pretty much ask in the RFP for a specific time frame. So all these companies are bidding on the same amount of hours. So you can almost just take that down to a dollar per hour rate and look at the, the varying rates of the construction inspector. So. Um, we did get a price that was well within our budget that we, we did think was fair and reasonable. Okay. Mr. Spies? Um, while we have you at the lectern, um, if you could just take 30 seconds to explain what the pump station does, why it's important, mm -hmm. and if you know the numbers, how many people it serves. Sure. Our, our sanitary sewer system is gravity sewer, which means that the pipes flow downhill and you can only get so deep in the ground. So at some point when you get deep enough, you have to have a pumping station. So then the, the sewage is then pumped up through a force main to a higher point in the gravity sewer system and then it flows downhill again from there. So we have 50 pumping stations in the city of Salisbury, which is significant. Uh, the Parkside pumping station serves a very large sewer shed which extends out to the east side of town. So actually the Philip Morris Drive pump station pumps into it and some of the other ones beyond that. So I don't have the number off the top of my head on exactly how many units that serves, but it's an extremely large sewer shed. And Parkside in particular is, is small. The capacity of Philip Morris, which is just upstream, is larger. So it's been on our radar for some time to need an upgrade because it, it, the capacity upstream exceeds that pump station capacity. The Mill Street pump station is located right here in downtown on Mill Street, and it seems it sees significant infiltration and inflow during storms. So that's a critical station where we're adding a generator and new electrical controls to help make sure that, that we're pumping accurately and, and adequately when it's raining. Great. So if we all lived on a hill, we wouldn't need pump stations. Correct. But we don't. If the treatment plant was at the bottom of the hill, it would look on the top. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Ms. Miller? The next item is a declaration of surplus for a Simline hot box. The Internal Services Department Procurement Division received a request from Salisbury Public Works to declare as surplus a Simline hot box that was purchased in January 2009. The equipment failed in 2010 and was repaired, but again in 2013 it experienced the same part failure. The machine is non-functional and unable to be repaired. A copy of the department memo is attached for further information. The procurement division requests council's approval to declare the noted item surplus and to allow the city of Salisbury Public Works Department to dispose of the hot patch machine. Okay. Questions? All right. The last item this evening is a declaration of surplus for the Salisbury Police Department. The City of Salisbury Internal Services Department Procurement Division received a request from the Salisbury Police Department to declare the following item surplus. It's a Sentry Fire Safe. The model and serial number are noted. Upon declaration of surplus as approved by City Council, the safe will be used to store SPD weapons. A copy of the departmental memo follows in your packet as well. 
Did, do they have a new safe or something? Do they have a new safe? Well, yeah. this, this will internal be used for them. No, no, I'm saying does internal services have a new safe? Procurement. Do we have a new safe? No, we're, we're oh, not. Oh, it, it was out. SPD. Got it, got yeah, it. Yeah, it was. Sorry. It was I think property. it was a, yep. yeah, confiscated. For some reason, I, I was thinking that it came from you and Sorry. it's going to SPD. Got no, it. No, we don't yeah. need one. <laughs> or I would one. like to ask a question, but I, yes. I want to go back to the previous item. Uh, okay. This is the hot box, and perhaps Public Works could give me an idea. I, we had a we bought this puppy in 2009 for twenty five thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars. Um, a year later, under warranty, um, the tongue broke off of it, which is a ramp or a diverting device of some sort. Okay. And then again, it broke off in uh, 2013, and I was unrepairable at that point. Uh, have there been design improvements over this? Are we buying from the same vendor? Once bitten, twice shy. Well, if we get around to asking for another one, I doubt we will. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's did you, yeah, Mr. Spies, oh. did you have anything else on the last item or no? No, that, okay. that's it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the award of bids as uh, as presented, please seek fire support by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Okay. Next item on our agenda is resolution number, thank you, Ms. Miller, uh, resolution number 2464. Uh, this is the agreement between the city, Salisbury Fire Company number two, and Morris family for the new fire station property. Invite... Uh, Mr. Stevenson, uh, you, uh, resolution 2464, or? Um, actually, Mr. Oh, Tillman's, Mr. Going Tillman's going to give us the, the, the updates and the changes first? Okay. All right, first, uh, entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Tillman. Thank you. Um, the resolution that appears in your packet is the one that was discussed during the negotiations at the last closed session. Uh, we've been waiting for some time to hear from the uh, lawyers and tax advisors of the Morris family as to how this uh, exchange of property was to be structured. Initially, it was thought it was going to be a like kind exchange, and that's the way it's worded in your contract. Um, Late uh, Wednesday afternoon, uh, we received an email from their lawyer with um, some proposed changes. Um, I had an opportunity to look at them Thursday afternoon uh, after the packet uh, went out. Um, and previously, we had discussed the fact that what tax option they picked really made no difference to the city at all. Um, but in addition, uh, what occurred was that they decided to do this as a charitable contribution to the city. And uh, as part of that, their lawyer advised them to get the city to pay for the appraisals. Uh, when I discovered this, I contacted the chief, and he contacted station number two uh, to see if station number two would agree to pay for the cost of those appraisals. And I've since learned that the chief does have money in his budget to do that. Um, fire station number two had felt that that was a fair exchange because the Morris is, in addition to restructuring this as a charitable contribution, also agreed to give up the property uh, where we were going to give them an easement behind the thing. So the city is now receiving that property as an additional contribution from the Morris family, and I'm sure the value of that would exceed whatever other obligation we have. Um, so that's pretty much uh, the way it is. The only other addition to that um, and I have been on the phone today and on Friday trying to, you know, get everything clarified. But the, the fire station number two's lawyers were doing uh, the title work for this transaction. And at, n at no time during that did, it, did someone uncover. Apparently, uh, the Morrises said that the city was given an easement for a parking lot. Um, and so next door to the existing fire station. And it's a paved area that apparently we've had access to for some time. I have not seen that title work yet. But as part of the agreement, the city would not only convey the existing fire station after it was destroyed, 
uh, but they would also convey their easement to use that parking area. Which it. parcel was the parcel in question that's being transferred to the city from the Mars family? Is that uh, there's a num There's a number of parcels. Being well, which, which was the parcel that was not included before that is now? Parcel, I believe it was four. Was they were retaining a, a portion of that property as well as an easement over the other properties to get to it. Parcel um, four? I believe that was four it. Or yeah. or the one in the back. Or was it? A map would be helpful. See, yeah, I, it's <laughs> the one that's in the back along the Let me Let me look on my. Yeah, yeah, I, I just want to make. They asked, if you go back to the fence line to the property line, they had asked for a, an easement to be able to have access along uh, along the property line in right. the back. I'm, I'm familiar with the request. I just want to make sure, because because there were changes last minute, I want to make sure I'm tracking where those changes were. You know. Um, yeah. So, me. so is this Morris and Morris property four? Is that what we're talking about? In yes, a portion of Morris and Morris property four, which was previously referred to. Yes. So they they were going to retain a portion of of property four and a right of way uh, to access that property. Now the entire property four will be conveyed to the city. Now, um, but in the agreement, um, mm -hmm. for example, under. Uh, section three covenants of the city um, the references are a bit different they're to parcel numbers and there's I don't see Morris and Morris property numbers you know there's references to parcel 496 parcel 1409 1410 1411 1418 1415 and I don't see where there's Morris and Morris park property number one two three four and five Is that identified on the plat? I don't have a copy of the plat in my possession this I think evening. We do either. So is this it in number three where it says um, uh, concurrently the city shall also this is under covenants of the city, sub paragraph three, mm -hmm. where it says concurrently second sentence, concurrently the city shall also obtain an appraisal of parcels and then it lists those numbers that I just read off, currently owned by Morris and Morris L T D partnership. The, the city shall accept a charitable donation of the difference in appraised var value between city parcel 496 and the Morris and Morris properties. Right. You, 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 uh, if, assuming that we were going to get, they were going to reserve the right of way, it was going to be de shown on Exhibit J as, as to which parcel. In other words, I think it was the parcel number four identified on that plat. That plat is no longer relevant because there is no right of way anymore. I, I just want to make sure I understand because I don't, think I do. I think the chief. Okay. What's on the ground? What, what this, my understanding of what is being presented and the changes that were not included before but have been included now is that the piece of property, what are we calling it, that, that was going to remain in the ownership of the Morris and Morris partnership, portion, portion of it, right. was going to remain in, under their ownership. They were, we were going to have an easement. Correct. No, they were. They, they were. They, we were going to grant them. An we were going to grant them an easement, so we were going to own it no matter what. It was landlocked property, which we were going to own the majority of that parcel, but a piece of it would re, would remain with the Morris family. And it, then there would be an easement, but none of that is going to happen now. That's what's hap That's the change. Okay. So so help me understand the purpose of this sentence. Then the city shall accept a charitable charitable donation of the difference in appraised value between city parcel 496 and the Morris and Morris properties. Right. The um, parcel number 496 is basically the existing fire station. Right. And we, the city will be, when the, the current fire station is completed, the city will be conveying that parcel to the Morris family. Right. And, but the Morrises on the other side of the road are conveying a number of parcels to the city. Right. And so it would basically just be an offset based on the values okay. after the appraisal. Okay, so there may be a, there may be a change of hand, uh, cash. Not cash. Exchange. It would no. be a charitable just contribution. To it will be, it will be considered everyone. a charitable contribution yes. is what that and meant. Everyone, everyone un anticipates un that their properties will, it will be worth more than ours. It will be considered a charitable contribution. <clears throat> Got it. For the difference. And the amount of that charitable contrib contribution will be determined, determined by the appraisal. Appraisal. determined by the appraisals that have not yet been done. Okay. When will that come to us? It 
won't because we're agreeing to it right here. We're yeah. letting them complete the transaction via this. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we, in fact, I mean, uh, uh, under the contract, we're going to, going to pick the appraiser. So I don't think anyone would quite, in other words, the city is going to pick an appraiser that the city believes will do a fair and adequate sure. job in you know, appraising these properties. The Morrises didn't even ask to pick their own appraiser. So, okay. and they're willing to accept uh, the difference in the values as established by the city's appraisals. You know, I, I recognize the, the sense of urgency here, but, but I do want to make sure that, that Ms. Mitchell, your concerns are getting addressed in terms of the changes that happened late yeah. in the day. Why don't you let me tell you exactly what those changes are? Because I have. If them. you can go, yeah, if oh, you can absolutely. go line by line, that would yeah. be better. Um, yeah. What uh, if if you look? Um, are you starting with the agreement or the ordinance or the resolution? I am beginning the resolution. Let's start with the resolution if you want to start there because that's, that's fine. That's simple. Um, the resolution on the first page was nothing but formatting. Uh, previously, the paragraph that begins on line, let's see, let me look at your copy, um, where it says, whereas um, Salisbury Fire Company number two owns the following real property. All we did and what you have before you today is create a par paragraph there so that you could see that more clearly. I didn't want the first property to be listed right after the colon. It, it just sets it out. No, no verbiage was changed there whatsoever. Okay. Um, also, I thought it was more clear to do the same thing when it listed the Morris and Morris Limited Partnership properties. 27. All we did uh, was make uh, begin a new paragraph where it starts line 29 on the version that you were provided tonight. Again, just so you would be able to read it more clearly and see that that was, in fact, an, an additional parcel of property. Um, The, uh, let me see. I think I did it on my version in here, so I need to turn to it. All right, and then the, other, the only other change would be beginning um, what was in the packet under line 61. It had the language in there that, that reserving unto itself, whereas Morris and Morris was going to reserve the right of way on the portion of property four, that language was struck. So the current version reads, whereas Morris and Morris Limited Partnership covenants and agrees to convey all of its right, title, and interest to the Morris and Morris properties unto the city. So the, the, that's in the resolution. So that's the only ch real change in verbiage at all from the resolution that you received to the resolution that was provided this evening. And, and there's the reference on lines 74 to 76 uh, about the agreement and it being attached as Exhibit A. I don't right. think yeah. that was added to it, right? Right. We, we, I just added the fact, and the, and the reason I did that and said in there on a form to be acceptable to the city solicitor is because of this issue of the 85 by 85 foot parking space. I just want to make sure if we need to make some minor change in the contract to cover that. I believe what's in there now does cover it. But right. uh, since the uh, title attorney was unavailable to speak, I couldn't speak to him today. Okay. Um, and and can you can you give us a sense of the changes to the agreement itself? Yeah, let me where they are. That one I think I can do a little better because I've got that right here in front of me. Um, the first change in the agreement, uh, if you look at the. Uh, the second page uh, where it says, whereas Morris and Morris covenants and agrees to convey all its right title and interest unto the Morris Mar and Morris properties unto the city, we just eliminated reserving unto itself the right of way again, just like you saw in the resolution. Okay. Right now, where are we? Page two. Right. <clears throat> uh, bottom of the page. Second. second. Okay. Yeah, part, part of the problem we had getting you a revised copy this afternoon was the lawyer for Morris and Morris did not provide us with an electronic copy that we could amend until this afternoon. So as soon as we got that electronic copy, we made the changes and shipped them out. Um, the, uh, the next change would be on the third page. Uh, there's an addition of a third uh, paragraph uh, and a fourth paragraph. I'm, and I'm not sure on your, they, they weren't previously on your copies. So that would be under Roman numeral three. 
Uh, you have A, paragraphs one and two, and we have added three and four. The three and four were the paragraphs added by the Morris's attorney to cover the, uh, the uh, charitable contribution. Okay. And then paragraph number four was the paragraph that he added to re make reference to the 85 by 80 foot, 85 foot parking lot, which the city is giving up any right to at the same time that we convey the fire station back to the Morris family. And when I say fire station, at that time there will be no fire station. The agreement is that that uh, building will be demolished and it will be an empty lot. I'm sorry, could you tell me that last one again? Mm -hmm. The one uh, you just... Paragraph four. Paragraph four. Yeah, Parag the addition of paragraph four uh, is simply a, a reference to the 85 by 85 uh, foot parking easement okay. that allegedly was given to the city years ago and uh, would just be, we would just release the Morrises from that easement at the same time that we convey the, the adjacent property to them. Okay. Um, the next change is under Roman numeral five. Uh, and the, uh, the only uh, subtraction there is, again, uh, the reference under subsection A, reserving unto itself an easement across the Morris and Morris property, that language is removed from the agreement. Okay. Um, and then uh, covenants of all parties, the references to the tax-free exchange are eliminated, uh, Roman numeral four. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. That's it. So, but in substance, the, uh, the changes all had to do with giving up that asset and then making this a charitable contribution instead of a tax-free exchange. Okay. Uh, the, and I guess the only substantive thing would be that the city would be responsible for the appraisals, but my understanding is the money is available according to the chief, and if you have any questions about that, okay. I would defer to him. Are there questions for Chief Hoppus? Ms. Mitchell, no. <laughs> well, no, I was asking uh, bigger picture. Are you satisfied? Although we got it last minute. Almost. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Spees, are you satisfied? Uh, any fears that I had are assuaged by the fact that we're having that assessment done by our our own people. Thank you. Okay. We've had okay. property assessments done before, and they were. Let's find a word for that. Weird. Thank you. Even when it does arise that we have to do these last minute, <clears throat> red line versions are much more helpful. Clean versions, great, but it really helps to have the red line version. Yeah, that, uh, that would have made it easier tonight. For sure. if, if, if I had gotten the electronic version sooner, I, I would have gotten that to you. This was put together at the last minute sure. just so that you would have it. I apologize for that. What it could mean in the future is, you know, that we end up in a situation where we have to postpone the decision and, you know, a time-sensitive matter like this that may not, you know, that may be problematic uh, in the future. So um, I know if everyone can do everything they can to ensure that we get these things in a timely fashion, we'd appreciate it. Um, any other questions, comments from council? Hearing none, all those in favor of resolution 2464, please signify your support by saying aye. Aye. And the chair votes aye. And that brings us to the end of our agenda this evening. I have no other requests for public comment. I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah, that's, right. that's next. That's, that's, that's next. Great. So I hope everyone enjoys their Thanksgiving. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Have a great night.